Okay. In the last lecture, I spent the whole lecture uh, showing the proof of positive real lemma. Uh, but uh, throughout the proof, I kept talking about uh, the definition of positive realness and uh, the definition of the matrix uh, situation for positive realness and so on. So, um, I would in this lecture initially uh, try to spend time and uh, give a, a sort of a better idea about uh, what this uh, definition of positive reality, especially for uh, matrices are. Uh, now, as far as the positive, uh, as far as the definition for positive realness uh, for matrices are concerned, I will be following uh, what is given in the book by Khalil. Uh, but uh, as I was saying earlier, for the scalar case, uh, there is no real agreement uh, about what exactly is the definition of positive realness. So, what I would do is I would just revisit what I had said about positive realness and I would uh, start with the scalar case and then I would uh, give you the definition for the, uh, for the matrix case. And, um, uh, motivate, um, you know, what are the um, advantages and disadvantages of the equivalent definitions which are there for uh, for positive realness. So, let me uh, start by uh, revisiting what the definition of positive realness is. Okay. So, given a transfer function g of s, uh, one definition for positive realness is you look at the Nyquist plot and if the Nyquist plot lies in the first and the fourth quadrant. So, if you have a Nyquist plot which looks like that for example, then that transfer function can be called positive real. This is one. Uh, one particular definition of positive realness that you could use. So, if if the Nyquist plot is in the first and the fourth quadrant, then you call it positive real. Okay, and um, uh, some time back, I had given examples of uh, of uh, transfer functions. So, this is single input, single output case. So, it is some polynomial divided by some other polynomial. Okay. Now, uh, if you look at uh, if you look at the theory of Nyquist uh, criterion, then you know that uh, if the degree, if the relative degree, that means uh, if p is a degree three polynomial and q is a degree four polynomial, then the relative degree is uh, one or minus one, depending upon your uh, the way you want to look at it. Uh, basically, only if the relative degree is one or zero can you expect to have the Nyquist plot restricted to these, this half. Now, the reason for that is because uh, if it is more than, if the relative degree is more than 1, then uh, it turns out that the angles that, uh, is, so if the, for example, if the denominator is uh, 2 degrees higher than the numerator, then what would happen is uh, finally, it would, uh, I mean the Nyquist plot would enter this quadrant. So, uh, one observation that you have uh, for single input, single output cases is the Nyquist plot is restricted to this half of the complex plane if and only if the relative degree is 1. Okay. Now, even if the relative degree is 1, we still not guaranteed uh, what we want as far as the positive real lemma is concerned. And uh, the reason for that is several. Okay. So, so let us just take this uh, definition that uh, G s has Nyquist plot in quadrants 1 and 4. Okay. Uh, this is the same as saying g of j omega plus g of minus j omega is greater than or equal to 0. Uh, mind you, in this particular case, I am thinking of g s as a single input, single output case. So, it is some polynomial 
divided by some other polynomial. And so this one is greater than or equal to 0. Yeah, so that means when you evaluate the, uh, the transfer function along the imaginary axis, that imaginary axis, the image of the imaginary axis lies in the right half, lies in the right half of the complex plane. Okay. Now, of course, we have this map from the complex plane to the complex plane and uh, the, what we are saying is that the image of the imaginary axis is something that lies in the right half of the complex plane. The, the image, I mean this map here is G S. So, any point S here goes to G S there. Now, uh, there are several examples of such things. So, for example, if you use S plus 1 by S plus 2, this transfer function when you look at this map and you look at where the imaginary axis maps to, that will lie completely in, in the right half. If you look at uh, minus s upon 1 minus s, this was also an example that I used earlier. And if you look at the map, if you take g s to be minus s upon 1 minus s and you look at the map, then again the imaginary axis will map to something here. Yeah. So, for example, in this particular case, it will map to some something like that. Okay. Now, uh, if positive realness definition is just taken to be this, then both of these will turn out to be positive real. Now, if you take the state space representation of this, state space representation of this and try to use the positive real lemma, the positive real lemma will be applicable to this only because uh, it's uh, the denominator has its uh, roots in the left half plane. Whereas, in this case the denominator has its roots not in the left half plane, but in the right half plane. And so, you cannot apply the um, positive real lemma. Earlier, I had also talked about uh, idea of uh, dissipativity and idea of storage function. So, in both these cases, you will get a storage function. The only difference between these two is that uh, in this case, you will because the denominator has all its uh, I mean uh, roots in the left half plane that means this is a stable transfer function. Therefore, in this particular case, the storage function that you get is positive. On the other hand, in this case also you can construct a storage function but this storage function is not going to be positive, it is going to be negative. Now, in physical systems, if you are talking about storage function, it is uh, it's, it's some function which stores energy. Now, if you are going to look at a, a function that stores energy and uh, that function is negative, that does not make sense. I mean, what does, uh, uh, what does it mean to say that uh, it, the amount of energy stored in the system is negative? Yeah. As a result, it does not make sense in this particular case, though you can still find a storage function, whereas it makes sense in this case and you can find a storage function. So, in both cases, so as soon as this equation is satisfied, you can find a storage function, but it is only when the, uh, when the transfer function is Hurwitz that you can find a storage function which is positive. Whereas, if it is not Hurwitz, then you can find a storage function, but that will not be positive. Okay. Now, if you look at this further, that means instead of just looking at it this way, if you put the condition that g s plus g of minus s is greater than or equal to 0 for all s such that the real part of s is greater than equal to 0. That means, instead of just looking at the imaginary axis, you look at where this whole half plane maps to under g s. Okay? And this whole half plane should map such that it falls in this right half. If you put this added condition, then because the imaginary part is in the boundary of this thing. That means, if the condition is this condition is satisfied, then this condition is automatically satisfied. Okay. 
but there is something more satisfied that means whatever is here now gets mapped to the right half plane then in that case this function for this transfer function it would be all right for this transfer function it will not be all right so if you take this transfer function and see where this right half maps to what you will get is this whole area outside the curve okay of course the, what that means is some of these points get mapped to points here which is not in the right half but in the left half whereas if you had taken s plus 1 by s plus 2 then the imaginary axis would have uh, uh, mapped to a curve and the right half would have mapped to the inside of the curve which means every point here on the right half is getting going to get mapped to the right half plane and so this equation captures the fact that this is satisfied plus the storage function is positive and therefore in some sense this should be the real definition of positive realness yeah but for historical reasons this is usually given as the definition for positive realness and uh, there are some places where this definition for positive realness is used but uh, if you give this definition for positive realness then such functions are also permissible and to disallow these functions the additional condition that is given is this condition holds plus g of s is stable and as it turns out that these two conditions together is equivalent to this condition yeah so um, the various books that you go through might have some mixture of these definitions as the definition for positive realness and this is for the scalar single input single output case and um, i mean depending upon your taste you can adopt any one of them as uh, what you would believe positive realness to be but uh, they all roughly say the same thing but there are these subtleties that uh, need to be handled so let me now give you the definition for uh, for positive realness as far as matrices are concerned okay so um, let's assume g of s is a p cross p transfer function matrix okay now uh, of course in all these cases this uh, matrix the transfer function matrix has to be a square matrix because the number of inputs have to be equal to the number of outputs so so g of s is a p cross p transfer function matrix then the following conditions have to be satisfied for gs to be to be declared as a positive real transfer function so g of s is positive real and uh, uh, this particular definition that i'm using is the definition that is given in uh, the book uh, by khalil nonlinear systems by khalil so um, just like what i said in the 1d case uh, here also in the multiple input multiple output there could be other opinions but i'm just sticking to this for now okay uh, is positive real if number 1 the first condition is poles of all elements in g of s are in the left half plane that means every element so every entry of g of s is a transfer function and every one of those transfer functions is hurwitz is uh, stable okay and the second condition is for all j omega i mean imaginary purely imaginary uh value where j omega is not a pole so where j omega is not a pole of any element in gs g transpose of j omega 
plus G transpose of minus G omega is is a positive semi definite matrix. So, this condition is precisely like the Nyquist plot condition in the single input single output case. Okay? So, what we are saying is for all j omega where j omega is not a pole, if j omega was a pole for some entry in, uh, in the transfer uh, function matrix, of course, then this thing will not be very well defined and there's, there are problems. So, you remove all those omega which might on the imaginary axis which might be a pole of any one uh, entry of g of s and for all the others you will have this. But of course, remember these are matrices. So, the sum of these two matrices one is claiming is a positive semi definite matrix a positive semi definite matrix. Okay? And there is one more condition the third condition is that uh, any purely imaginary. So, any purely imaginary root uh, or rather pole purely imaginary pole of G of s is a simple pole. Okay is a simple pole that means, it does not have um, multiplicity uh, high greater than 1 and the residue and the residue. So, so the way you obtain the residue is uh, limit s tending to j omega of s minus j omega times g s is positive semi definite Hermitian. Okay. So, so, there are these three conditions. So, the third condition is that for any purely imaginary pole of G s. Uh, so, any purely imaginary pole of G s is a simple pole and the residue limit as you tend towards that pole of this particular thing. That residue of course, here is it is a matrix. So, it is in fact, a positive semi definite Hermitian matrix. So, the, the definition for positive realness is this. So, now if you just specialize you take G s to be a 1 cross 1 transfer function, well the poles are all in the left half plane, well as we had said before. And this is the Nyquist condition, uh, Nyquist criterion condition. So, the Nyquist plot in the first and the fourth quadrant and this one is the stability. So, these two conditions are what? Uh, this is an additional condition that appears in the matrix case. Uh, in the scalar case, this uh, is clearly true, but uh, in the matrix case, it is a bit more involved and uh, therefore, this condition makes its appearance. So, this is the definition for uh, positive realness as far as matrices are concerned. And so, now if you take a G cross G uh, P cross P transfer function matrix G of S and you want to talk about it being positive real you put these um, uh, these things these criterion in and uh, you can check whether it is positive real. And in the earlier lecture uh, when I talked about the positive real lemma. Well, there G s could just be taken to be positive real with this definition and uh, as far as the realization is concerned whether it is single input single output or multiple input multiple output the realizations would be in terms of those matrices and so that matrix condition uh, would remain unchanged. Okay. So, now uh, since we have also already done uh, the positive real lemma there are variations of the positive real lemma. If you remember the positive real lemma uh, ultimately in the statement about the matrices, there is the specific matrix uh, matrix P which is a positive definite matrix or uh, positive semi definite matrix. Now, this positive semi definite matrix during the proof of the positive real lemma or, or in fact, when I showed that uh, the existence uh, I mean the existence of those equations are equivalent to 
uh, the system being passive, I had made use of the fact that this matrix P defines the storage function. Now this, if P is a positive definite matrix, then the storage function is positive definite. If P is a positive semi-definite function, then the storage is positive semi-definite. Okay. Now, between the situation when the storage function is positive definite and the storage function is positive semi-definite, uh, there is a slight problem and this problem is very much similar to the kind of problem that you would get when you use um, systems with uh, inputs, no outputs and you are using Lyapunov theory. Now, in Lyapunov theory, when you take, um, uh, when you take a function which is positive definite, then that actually guarantees uh, whatever is the conclusions that you can draw from using Lyapunov theory. Whereas, if you take something which is positive semi-definite, you cannot utilize it uh, to the full power of the uh, Lyapunov theory. Yeah, so, you cannot uh, as a Lyapunov function candidate, you have to always take something which is positive definite and you hope that its derivative is negative definite. Uh, but if the derivative is negative semi definite, you cannot draw that strong a conclusion. Yeah, I mean uh, uh, your, your conclusions that you can draw is weaker and so on and so forth. So, in the same way as is in exactly the same way. As far as storage functions are concerned, when you have positive definite storage functions, it is good and when you have positive semi definite storage functions, it is not that good. And uh, the statement of the positive real lemma only guarantees that the storage function is um, positive semi definite, not positive definite. Now, in order to guarantee the positive definiteness of the storage function, one brings in this additional thing. So, there we had shown that positive semi-definite storage function, I mean positive semi-definite P and those other uh, matrix conditions are equivalent to the transfer function being positive real. Now, one can give an additional thing which is uh, additional definition kind of thing. Uh, which guarantees that the storage function is strictly positive definite. Now, the storage function being strictly positive definite is equivalent to the transfer function being strictly proper real. So, we have already given some definition for G s being uh, positive real. Yeah. So, there is a Nyquist condition and so on and so forth. Now, we say G of s is strictly positive real when G of s minus epsilon is positive real. Yeah for epsilon greater than 0. I mean epsilon greater than 0 uh, small for small epsilon greater than 0. Okay. Uh, what we mean by this is you see earlier when I was talking about positive realness, uh, I had said that uh, of course, this is a map G of s. So, any point s goes to the corresponding point here and uh, the imaginary axis mapping to something and then the right half mapping to the inside of course, is the good thing that can happen and that is the definition of positive real. Okay. Now, um, in this particular situation where which I have drawn where the imaginary axis maps to this and the right half maps to the inside clearly if instead of g of s we take the map g of s minus epsilon that also would map to you know some neighborhood of this and so in fact this particular this particular situation g of s is strictly positive real uh, it might happen that uh, you have some plot which looks like that the imaginary axis maps to something like that 
and then the right half plane perhaps maps to something like that. And now if you look at g of s minus epsilon, then the perturbation might be such that this gets moved like that. And because it gets moved like that, g of s minus epsilon does not satisfy the positive realness condition. And so, this will not be strictly positive real. And this touching in the imaginary axis of this area, this region, it maps to some other region here. And uh, that region, how it touches the imaginary axis, that in some sense defines the uh, positive definiteness and the positive semi definiteness of the storage function. And so, when you do this g of s minus epsilon, that means you perturb by epsilon, in some sense what you are doing is you are moving this imaginary axis. And so, if there are these places where it touches the imaginary axis, this image, then when you shift the imaginary axis, then those things get mapped to the left half and uh, g of s minus epsilon does not uh, does not remain positive real. So, such things which are on the boundary, they are not strictly positive real, anything else is strictly positive real. Okay. Now, of course, uh, just like the positive real lemma, there is also uh, a famous uh, uh, lemma which uh, instead of talking about the equivalence of positive semi definite P and um, uh, G of S being uh, g of s being positive real, uh, it talks about the equivalence of strictly positive real. Okay. And uh, this particular theorem uh, is attributed to three uh, famous people, Kalman, Yakubovich, yeah, Yakubovich and Popov. So, this lemma is attributed to all three of them and the lemma is exactly the same as the positive real lemma. The only difference is that G s is strictly positive real. So, instead of positive real earlier you had only positive real, now you have the additional strictly if and only if. Okay. And so, now you have the equations which are uh, A transpose if and only if there exists P positive definite and other two matrices L and W such that A transpose P plus P A is equal to minus L transpose L, m L transpose L minus epsilon times P and P B is equal to C transpose minus L, L transpose W and W transpose W is equal to D plus D transpose. Of course, here just like in the earlier strictly uh, in the uh, positive real lemma here also all the assumptions are that this A, B, C and D uh, come from a minimal state representation of G S. So, as you see between the positive real lemma and this lemma, the only difference is that G s on one side we are saying is strictly positive real and on the other side in this Lyapunov equation instead of A transpose A P plus P A being equal to minus L transpose L, there is this additional epsilon P and this, uh, this sort of guarantees the, uh, the strictly positive real situation and it guarantees the positive um, uh, storage function. So, let me now revisit and uh, um, look at uh, what we have been talking about earlier and why we started looking at this uh, positive real transfer functions and so on. So, the reason why we started looking at this positive real transfer functions is first of all there was this Isomann's conjecture and uh, from the Isomann conjecture, uh, 
a certain guess was taken that you know if you have a non-linearity in some certain sector and you um, have a feedback connection of that non-linearity with a linear system uh, then uh, if that linear system with those particular gains gives you a stable uh, uh, closed loop system then the uh, linear system with the non-linearity in that loop uh, will give you a stable system and then we also saw that uh, counter examples were given so Isomann's conjecture is not correct. Uh, now after that uh, we came into this passive systems and what these passive systems are and we have a, a lot of results with uh, respect to passive systems. Now the important thing about passive systems is that um, if you interconnect two passive systems, I mean if you have a feedback connection of two passive systems, then the resulting system is also passive. And this makes uh, things very, um, very good because uh, what, what one is really saying is if you start off with some system which is passive and you have another system which is passive and you interconnect the two, the new system that you get which is the interconnection of the two systems is also passive. And uh, this, uh, I mean especially if you think about this passivity in terms of the energy. Uh, that means uh, the passive system is something where the total amount of energy supplied is either dissipated or uh, it goes to increase the stored energy, then this uh, seems very natural. Uh, but what we will now do is we will formally show that when you interconnect two passive systems, the resulting system turns out to be passive. As a result, it turns out that this concept of passivity is something that goes a long way in answering the question raised by Isomann and in fact providing an answer which is similar to what Isomann guessed. Okay, so, so let me begin by first talking about the, mm, uh, the dilemma or uh, the theorem, okay, uh, might as well call it a theorem interconnection of two passive systems is passive. Okay. Uh, okay, so what do I mean by this interconnection? Okay, so let me assume this is system 1, mm, let me call it G1. So, let me call the input u1 and uh, the output y1 and let me have a second system g2. So, uh, okay, input, you see when you are talking about input and output, uh, one needs to probably draw an arrow so that it is clear what is the input and what is the output. So, u1 is the input and uh, y1 is the output hmm. and let us have another system g2 and uh, this system has u2 as the input and y2 as the output. Now g1 is passive, what does it mean to say g1 is passive? Well. Uh, one uh, one thing that from all the discussion that we had about passivity is that u1 y1 you, let me say u1 transpose so uh, rather than think of it as single input single output you, i could think of it as uh, multi input multi output so i'm saying y, u1 transpose y1 is greater than equal to v1 dot where this v1 is the storage function of the first system. Okay, so, uh, we had said that for the passive systems, the product of the input and the output is greater than or equal to the rate of change of the storage function. So, so V1 uh, is like uh, the amount of energy stored in G1 uh, roughly and uh, so 
u1 transpose y1 is like the amount of energy supplied and uh, the energy supplied is greater than equal to the rate of change uh, or the power supplied is greater than equal to the rate of change of um, uh, the stored stored energy in the first system now this one being uh, passive essentially you have a similar statement u transpose y2 must be greater than equal to v2 dot yeah and this v2 dot is the storage function of the second transfer function okay now let's look at what we mean by interconnection so let's interconnect it in the following way so i put in this this thing and uh, I will assume that there is some input E1 coming into the net system and maybe I subtract this. So, what this essentially tells me is that U1 equal to E1 minus Y2 and I do a same kind of thing here. So, there is some input here which let me call it E2. Now, of this system, this is the interconnected system and in this interconnected system, I can think of the vector E1, E2, the vector E1, E2 as being the set of inputs. Okay? And I can continue to think of y1 and y2 as a set of outputs. So, then input times output is essentially E1 y1 plus E2 y2. Now, for E1, if I substitute U1 plus Y2, so I get U1 plus Y2 times Y1 plus, now oh, I have not written the equation for this. Here, this I would continue to call it positive. So, what I have is U2 is equal to E2 plus Y1. Okay. So, this E 1 y 1 plus E 2 y 2 is equal to U 1 plus y 2 times y 1 and for E 2 I can substitute E 2 is U 2 minus y 1. So, U 2 minus y 1 times y 2. Of course, there are these transposes, but uh, that really does not matter. Now, you see you, you have a y 2 transpose y 1 and you have a y 1 transpose y 2, but with negative signs. So, they sort of cancel. So, what you are left with is u 1 transpose y 1 plus u 2 transpose y 2, which from these two inequalities you know is greater than or equal to v 1 dot plus v 2 dot. Now, what does this mean? This means that if you take this E1 and E2 as the inputs for the interconnected system and the Y1 and Y2 as the output, so for this interconnected system, when you look at the inputs multiplying the outputs, this is greater than or equal to the rate of change of a storage function, which is in fact the sum of the storage functions of the first one and the second one. So, in physical systems, if this was a physical system and it had some uh, elements which stored energy and this is another system which has some elements which is, store, which is storing energy, then the complete storage function is the sum of this storage function plus this storage function. Yeah. So, now this is an extremely powerful uh, sort of um, uh, result. And uh, therefore, I mean what we can say is if you have two systems which are passive and you interconnect it, then the interconnected system continues to be passive. Now, um, if I mean how this, uh, this theorem becomes really powerful is, the, is by the following means. You see suppose you think of this G 1, this system G 1 as a linear system which is passive. G 2 is some system which is let us say a non-linear system, but you can sort of uh, 
by some method means show that this is passive. Then if you interconnect these two, then the interconnected system is also passive. So, if this was a nonlinear system and you managed to find some storage function for this nonlinear system, then in some sense you have found a storage function for the complete nonlinear system. Now, if you are talking about, for example, um, Lyapunov theory, and uh, so you do not think of these inputs. Uh, earlier we had discussed how given a general um, general nonlinear equation you can split it up into a linear part and a nonlinear part and now if you can show that this linear part is passive and this nonlinear part is passive independently and for this nonlinear part you can find some storage function for the linear part, of course, we already have the positive real lemma and the Kalman Yakubovich Popov lemma by which you can find storage function. Then the sum of these two storage functions act like the uh, storage function for the net system, but with zero input, the sum of the two storage functions would act like the Lyapunov function, and therefore, this is in, in fact a way to construct a Lyapunov function for that particular system. Okay. Now, how this connects up with Isomann's idea is what uh, I will now try to explain and uh, for that, uh, first let me uh, consider non-linearities which, uh, which are memoryless. Okay. So, what I me mean by a memoryless non-linearity is the following. If you give a certain input to the non-linearity, you get an output, but this output is not dependent upon what happened in the system earlier in time or later in time whatever. Uh, it is an instantaneous map. So, what I am trying to say is that uh, whatever is the input, the output is completely determined by what the input is at this instant. The output at this instant is completely de determined by the input at this instant. Such, uh, such maps we would call a nonlinearity. Now, if you have a nonlinearity, uh, I mean, such a map we would call a memoryless nonlinearity. So, if you have a memoryless nonlinearity, then one way you can characterize that nonlinearity is by this map where you have the input and here you draw the output. So, for any given input, there is a particular output. For this input, there is some particular output, and so you can um, connect all those dots and uh, you get a curve. Of course, if this curve was a straight line passing through the origin, then uh, the nonlinear system is not really nonlinear, but it's linear. But if you have this situation, it's a nonlinear. So this is a nonlinearity. Yeah. So for any given, so this is like a lookup table, if you want. Given any input, you go through the graph, and you know what exactly the output is. Now, if you have a nonlinearity such that this curve, okay, so let me call this nonlinearity f, then this nonlinearity is such that if the input is u, then u times f of u is greater than 0 or greater than equal to 0. Then as far as the nonlinear system is concerned, so here is the nonlinear system. Suppose this is the input going into the nonlinearity, and what you get here is f of that. And what you are saying is input multiplied by output is always greater than 0. Then, from whatever we have been discussing earlier, we could call this passive. And now, if you call this passive, yeah. Uh, this thing is memoryless. That means, uh, in the sense, uh, it just depends on what the instantaneous input is. One could think of the storage function. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the definition of passivity is u dot y input multiplying output is greater than or equal to the rate of change of the storage function. Uh, suppose you take the storage function to be the zero storage function, then you get this. That means u dot y is greater than or equal to zero, and uh, so assuming that this storage function is a zero storage function, 
is one way that uh, this equation is satisfied. And so, you have a passive system, this nonlinear system is passive and it has a storage function which is a zero storage function. And uh, here is the beauty of the whole thing. Suppose you take a matrix, uh, a linear system G of s and you take a nonlinearity and this nonlinearity is in the first and the third quadrant. Okay. Uh, incidentally, nonlinearities which are in the first and third quadrant are often uh, denoted by this. This is a nonlinearity lying in the zero infinity sector that means they lie here or here the slope uh, or uh, rather if you take any u the f of u. Uh, in fact, I had given this kind of a definition earlier uh, if you call the input psi f of psi by psi is less than infinity. Okay. Such nonlinearities, zero infinity nonlinearity. And uh, if you have any nonlinearity like this, then of course, uh, this is true psi times f of psi is greater than or equal to 0. And from what I said in the last slide, one could view this as passivity. So, if you have a nonlinearity which belongs to this class and uh, you have a feedback structure which looks like this. Then if this G s, I mean this linear part, if G s is passive and the nonlinearity is uh, or belongs to, okay, it is a nonlinearity like this, then uh, G s is passive, the nonlinearity is passive. So, from what we had talked about earlier, the interconnection of these two, uh, 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 the interconnection of these two systems is also passive. Now, this is passive, what we mean by that is if this input is u and the output is y, then what we are saying is u transpose y is greater than equal to v dot, where v is the storage function as far as this guy is concerned. And the nonlinearity is passive, well, it is the same y here and out here what you have would be the negative of this u. So, let me call it minus u, but this uh, minus u and y, it obeys the uh, rules of the, of the nonlinearity. Therefore, minus u transpose y is greater than or equal to 0. Yeah this is for the nonlinearity and because it is in the 0 infinity sector this must be true, this g s is passive. So, this must be true. I add these two I get 0 greater than or equal to v dot. So, this is an autonomous system in which I have v provided g s is passive. I can find the storage function to be a positive definite function. And I have therefore, a positive definite function whose derivative is less than 0. Therefore, the resulting system is asymptotically stable. So, if you remember Isomann's conjecture said that uh, if you had some trajectory which lied in this sector, uh, something like this. And uh, his conjecture was that if you had a g of s such that on the feedback loop, if you, if you put any gain between 0 and infinity and it gives you a stable system, then if you put a nonlinearity, then the resulting closed loop system is asymptotically stable. And uh, that was uh, proven to be false. But what we have got is a very similar result. What we are saying is if you take any nonlinearity in the 0 infinity sector, and out here, you are not going to take any transfer function such that uh, you know you put any gain between 0 and infinity and the resulting feedback system is asymptotically stable. That is not what you are going to do. What you are going to do instead is instead of that condition, you are going to take a G s which is passive. And if you do that, then the resulting system is such that it is asymptotically stable. Yeah. So, um, if you recall 
earlier um, a few lectures back I had shown uh, that in Eisenman's conjecture there is some sort of um, uh, counter example I showed. And uh, if you remember in that counter example the G s that I took was s plus 1 upon s squared. Now, if you look at this particular transfer function and you look at its uh, Nyquist plot, it will be clear that this is not a passive transfer function and as a result um, uh, one cannot expect this, uh, this uh, interconnected system to be, uh, to be passive and therefore asymptotically stable. So, um, the interconnection of passive systems being passive that result uh, in fact is a solution to the Eisenman's conjecture in the sense it is a positive um, it is a positive reply to Eisenman's conjecture in the sense that if you have a nonlinearity in the 0 infinity sector then uh, that is like interpreting the nonlinearity as a passive nonlinearity and therefore, you interconnect it with a passive linear system and the resulting system is passive and because the resulting system is passive what you have is asymptotic uh, stability. Okay. So, um, I am out of time for this lecture and so um, uh, we would stop uh, here today.